Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I'm always down to answer gardening tips, especially uh, when it comes to peppers. Uh, one of my favorite things to grow. So um, yeah, I will share my screen here. Let's see. And oops. one second, stop share. Need to reset. Let's see, share screen. Sorry, where the bar is, it's like underneath where I need to push it to. Oh, there we go. That works. Okay. Can you guys see it? Everybody good? See it? Yeah, okay. We can see it. Awesome. So I'm going to talk about avian scatter hoarders and um, kind of their impacts on plant communities, which are um, many and vary, but I'm at least going to give a few examples of local um, plant animal mutualisms that we could observe, uh, whether they're in our backyard or in California, and then maybe mention a few uh, in other places as well. But I'll first start with going over some um, background information for everybody so that we're on the same page. So uh, why do I like to talk about seed dispersal so much? This is something that I'll just ramble on about forever, um, whether it's birds or rodents. Um, I mostly studied actually rodent dispersal for my uh, master's project, but since uh, birds are also an important component of juniper dispersal, they were um, also a part of my master's, but I was mainly um, trapping kangaroo rats and following where they were uh, placing seeds. Um, and there were also pinion mice and uh, golden mantle ground squirrels, a whole community of rodents that were responsible for dispersing those seeds. So, um, but I was lucky enough to work out uh, in the pine nut range during which time I got to see a lot of pinion jays. So that was awesome. And I, I miss being out there every morning and hearing them. So um, when it comes to seed dispersal, there are uh, two main modes, abiotic and uh, biotic dispersal. Abiotic dispersal is dispersal by water, like uh, large coconut seeds that float along the coast um, or wind like dandelion seeds that we think are um, typical of wind dispersal. And we also have gravity and autocory, which is uh, plants that eject their seeds. Biotic dispersal is what I'm more interested in since it involves dispersal by animals. Uh, you have a few forms of biotic dispersal, uh, epizucory, endozucory, and synzucory. Epizucory is when seeds get attached to the outside of an animal. So you might get cheatgrass seeds in your dog's fur when you're walking around in Nevada in particular. Um, then you have endozucory, which occurs when the seed goes inside and starts with endo, which is inside. Um, the bird uh, swallows usually a fruit and then passes the seeds intact in their feces and disperse the seeds that way. They can also regurgitate seeds, which is um, what a lot of toucans do. I was lucky enough when I was in Ecuador to watch a toucan cough up a seed. And as a seed dispersal person, I was freaking out. I thought it was just the coolest thing ever. So, um, and then we have sinzu curry, which uh, mainly people, when you think about scatter hoarding, you think rodents and you think squirrels or chipmunks. So they are generally the poster children for uh, sinzu curry or scatter hoarding, but Birds actually that play a pivotal role for a lot of species, um, especially oaks and pines that are highly dependent on not just rodents, but on birds as well. So um, I always like to make sure that people understand how important some of these uh, relationships are that often go overlooked. So an epizucory, like I said, is on the outside of the um, animal, but I thought I'd mention some cool uh, bird examples. Uh, ducks, for instance, there's some um, aquatic plants and microorganisms or even eggs of animals that will disperse on the feet and feathers of ducks. So ducks can disperse some aquatic plants from pond to pond just on the outside of their feathers. And then there are also trees that have sticky seeds that um, will attach to a bird while they're foraging and then get um, they'll fly off and land on another plant and disperse seeds. So there are some cool, um, but pretty rare instances of epizucury in birds. 
Um, endozookery is a uh, frugivory, as I was talking about. You have birds that swallow um, a seed that is encased in a berry, and there are just so many examples of this worldwide. I could give a whole, this would be a much longer talk if I talked about um, dispersal through uh, endozookery. And this is generally what people think of when they think of birds dispersing seeds. They think of, you think of the robin on the tree or bush in your front yard that's just consuming hundreds of berries and then that robin flies off. Or here we have um, a cedar waxwing. I took this picture during my master's project, consuming a Western juniper berry and then flying off and perching and passing the seeds somewhere else. Um, these uh, relationships can be directed. So um, for instance, a lot of birds have specific perches they'll use. And so um, these frugivory relationships can go to very specific microsites. And in the tropical rainforest, 85% of all tree species are dispersed by vertebrate frugivores. So these relationships are very important and pretty well studied. I mean, even though there's still probably so many examples that are yet to be fully understood, um, frugivory and bird dispersal is pretty, um, pretty well studied uh, topic. Then we have sinzukery, which is um, when you have dispersal by a seed caching animal and they scatter hoard the seeds, which I'll explain what that is in a little bit here. But um, I've included this picture because I have a scrub jay that definitely puts peanuts in my pots. One of the neighbors must be leaving peanuts out. And actually I found a peanut inside my uh, Christmas wreath on my front door when I went to take it apart, which was just like, kind of cracked me up and it's mind blowing but um yeah so most of you guys if you put out any food um you'll notice that the scrub jays will come and take it and fly off and then come back but uh they um are very prolific seed dispersers and um they can also directly disperse um seeds to specific microsites and when you say directed dispersal it's when they're taking the seeds to um, microsites that are beneficial for the plant, so be beneficial for seedling germination. So um, in a lot of cases, um, you have uh, specific, birds will have specific microsites, say like, like under a shrub or maybe out in the open. And for some plants, it's better to be under a shrub because they need a nurse plant. And so they actually benefit from being cached underneath another plant, whereas other plants actually benefit from being cached in the open. And so um, when you have a mixed disperser assemblage between birds and rodents, it's actually probably better for the plant because you have them placing the seeds in different microsites and allowing for there to be different benefits from those different microsites. So um, a lot of um, these seed dispersal agents in these scatter hoarding or sinzukery systems also act as seed predators. And so, you know, there's a fine line that um, they walk between being a disperser versus a seed predator. So that means that, you know, this relationship actually exists on a continuum between mutualism on one side and antagonism on the other. So it's never a 100% beneficial or 100% antagonistic, generally somewhere on this line. So when you have a mutualism, it benefits both organisms and antagonism, you know, one organism benefits over the other. So in this graph, it shows the probability of an animal caching a seed and then not eating or removing the seed. So it's staying in the ground, um, which animals will forget seeds. They generally, it's um, birds and rodents. It's shown to uh, retrieve about 80% of their seeds. So when they're caching tens of thousands of seed, they're still leaving thousands of seeds in the ground. So um, also if an animal gets eaten, then their seeds get left in the ground. And so there's a lot of ways that they're not recovering all of the seeds that they're placing in the ground. Um, you then have on the other side of this axis, the emergence of seeds on the ground versus from being buried in a cache. So when I'm saying scatter hoarding, this is when um, the birds are burying seeds into the ground, right? So in the desert, you can imagine that this is beneficial since it's really hot. And so if a seed is sitting on the soil surface, it's going to experience dehydration. It can also be carried off by a predator, an, an animal that only eats seeds and doesn't cache seeds. Whereas um, some seeds really need to be buried and larger seeds cannot be buried abiotically, right? So they can't be buried without the help of another animal. 
um, just because they're too large to just be incorporated into the soil. I mean, they can by chance. There is a, that's not like a hundred percent thing. Obviously, if you're out in the sandy in a sandy area, seeds can be have sand blown over them and be buried. But in general, larger seeds uh, need to be buried by something, or some seeds are um, able to just sprout from the soil surface. So. Um, yeah, so it, it exists between this mutualism and antagonism relationship. So there's two different types of food hoarding strategies um, in Sinzu Kori. So you have um, larder hoarding, which is the placement of seeds in a central location, such as a burrow or tree hollow. Um, these photos I have are from my masters. Um, we have a large um, kangaroo rat burrow. For um, bird scatter hoarders, they generally use tree hollows. Um, one of the reasons, like a lot of tit species or even um, chickadees, they store food, but they're not actually seed dispersal agents because they generally store food in tree hollows or in bark or in places that seeds cannot germinate. So um, as we'll be talking about in a bit here, only mainly corvids are actual scatter hoarders. As a lot of other um, bird species that do um, collect and hoard food are not placing those seeds in the ground. So these um, seeds generally don't lead to seedling recruitment. But then you can have um, scatter hoarding, which is what I'll be talking about today, which is where uh, birds are placing their seeds in these scattered, superficially buried caches. So when I'm saying superficial, I'm saying you know, a few centimeters or just a few inches. So um, larger seeds generally need to be buried deeper, smaller seeds um, less deep. So um, depending on how deep a lot of um, the different species bury seeds, it can vary whether they're being more, you know, antagonistic or mutualistic. So um, caches that aren't recovered can germinate um, when you have scatter hoarding because these seeds are placed in the soil. So this was a cache I found during my master's that a kangaroo rat had made. And generally, when you see plants coming up from caches, you see them come up in these seedling clumps. So bitter brush, if you're out in the spring and you see bitter brush seedlings, you'll often see them coming up in clumps. And that's because they are cached by chipmunks and other scatter hoarding rodents. So, um, and many plants actually benefit from being grouped like this. So we have an example is Indian rice grass in the Great Basin. And um, through my research or our research at the USDA, we found that it actually survives better in clumps than it does as a single seedling. Um, so many plants that are adapted to dispersal through um, scatter hoarding are actually have adaptations to um, survive in clumps. And uh, white bark pine is another example. If you go up to the top of Mount Rose, you'll see a lot of the white bark pine seedlings coming up in clumps. And then a lot of the trees kind of grow together and form one tree. So um, they are also are adapted to growing in clumps. So um, some of the things that might drive cache site selection or where these birds are placing their seeds are two things, basically pilferage avoidance and perishability. So pilfering is stealing basically. So it's when another animal comes. So this um, nutcracker down, spotted nutcracker down here might cache this acorn but then a squirrel might come along and pilfer that um, acorn. So um, a lot of times birds are trying to place their seeds in microsites that rodents aren't going to notice and also in sites that um, other birds aren't going to notice. So rodents have an advantage over birds because they can smell. So they can recover birds caches, a cache of another bird, but they can't but birds cannot recover rodent caches unless they see rodents caching. So um, I know my uh, master's uh, advisor, Steve Vanderwall, they used to observe that rodents um, would, would look for the jays to see if they were watching because if a jay saw a rodent caching, they could go down and steal their cache, but if they don't see it, then they're not able to smell it. So there is like a disadvantage between the two. And then birds are also conscious of perishability because um, if a cache is placed in an area where it's going to get fungus really quick or go bad really quick, that's bad, but then it's also um, not good if the seed germinates really quickly. So generally, um, birds are trying to find microsites that have a balance between those two factors. And so these are um, factors that go into, um, you know, why and where a bird might select a place to place a seed. So um, here we have a cool diagram that talks about the different um, factors going into selection. 
and um, some of the key steps in scatter hoarding process. And this is from um, Pessendorfer at all 2016. Um, this figure is just, I really like this drawing because it kind of shows how, you know, they can be either caching within a suitable patch or birds can be caching in this area in between patches or, um, you know, it just shows how they can kind of are selecting their different sites um, and they can place seeds in all of these sites, but only some of these sites will allow for the um, seed or the acorn to germinate. So, um, yeah, and birds in particular in comparison to rodents, they generally travel a lot farther. So that is um, one thing that uh, when you're comparing bird and rodent dispersal, birds are definitely able to travel more to these um, between, travel between patches and um, help to a plant to spread between um, an occupied patch and an unoccupied patch. So which birds are scatter hoarders? There are a lot of bird species on Earth, but very few um, scatter hoard. And most of those that are scatter hoarders are found in Corvidae. So crows, ravens, jays, magpies, and nutcrackers. And um, the most scatter hoarding species are actually found in the latter, jays, magpies, and nutcrackers, with jays and nutcrackers being the most prolific um, seed scatter hoarders. because. Magpies all like to, they like to hide all kinds of stuff. So um, since they have a more um, diverse diet and they're less carnivorous, um, there's about 120 species of corvids worldwide and um, a whole lot of species of plants that likely de depend on these uh, dispersal agents. So this kind of just shows um, some overlap between pines and uh, oak. So Quercus are oak species and pinus pine species worldwide and it's kind of cool it shows an overlap um, in the pink we have scrub jays and then um, green is uh, pinion jays we have the eastern blue jay uh, eurasian jays in the yellow and then nutcracker species in orange and it's really interesting to see that um, in the north you have a lot of the pines that overlap with um, either jays or nutcrackers and then across um, the more middle latitudes you have oaks that also overlap with um, jays and magpies so i mean just by looking at their distributions it appears that you know there are some important relationships between these species that have led to these patterns So um, now I'm going to go over a few examples that you could observe somewhat locally, at least, um, you know, with California jays, uh, you'd be going west, but we do have Woodhouse's jays. And um, throughout these slides, I'm not going to be giving an exhaustive list because um, scrub jays in particular probably disperse, they definitely disperse more plants than we are aware of. They disperse, they're really important dispersal agents for oaks, but then they also, I've seen them take juniper seeds and they take pine seeds. As you may see, they take sunflower seeds and they scatter hoard them in my yard. Fortunately, then I don't have to plant sunflowers. Um, but there's probably so many relationships that we still don't even understand because these guys are really intelligent and have a pretty diverse diet. Um, so scrub jays are especially important for oaks, especially where their ranges overlap. Um, they generally cache them like one acorn at a time, which is great for the oak. Um, and it's probably also because it's difficult for them to carry more than one ac acorn since they're kind of gape limited. Um, and they don't really have um, any special adaptations to hold more than, um, you know, a couple acorns. Uh, squirrels are also really important um, dispersal agents for oaks, especially in California but um, they generally use different microsites, like I said, and uh, scrub jays are really important for those longer distance or between patch um, dispersal events. So some of the adaptations they have um, where acorns are um, abundant, they have very deep, stout, slightly hooked bills. And then in area where they have overlap with a lot of pinion pine, they have more shallow and pointed bills. And so even um, you know, within the scrub jays, there's some of these specialized adaptations. And so these bill shapes help them to open their preferred food, whether it's a stout bill for opening acorns and then the hook that helps them rip off the shell or a thinner, more pointed bill to help them get between the scales of pine cones, which um, when we get to the next few examples, we'll see 
um, such as the Clark's Nutcracker, as you can see, they have a much longer, thinner bill. And this is because they are specializing in pine seed. And um, one of the relationships that's been really well documented and is uh, well understood at this point is um, the relationship between Clark's Nutcracker and white bark pine, but they've also been, um, there have been published papers showing that they also important dispersal agents for limber pine and they also disperse pinion pine and Jeffrey pine seeds as well as probably others that we're not even aware of. Um, these guys have such cool um, adaptations that allow them to disperse seeds, but also um, storing food in general. One of the reasons that they are storing food is it allows them to start nesting as early as mid-February. So because they have a food source through the winter, it actually gives them an advantage of being able to have a longer period of time to raise their young. Um, and this food hoarding and recovery requires them to have um, incredible spatial memory. So they, they cache thousands and thousands of seeds and they recover a large portion of them. Um, and so that means that they are highly intelligent birds. Um, one of the really cool adaptations they have is this uh, sublingual pouch. And on um, the diagram to the side, you can kind of see the musculature around it and how it extends for them to um, collect seeds. So it's kind of on the floor of the mouth in front of the tongue and it can carry up to 95 pinion pine seeds. I mean, maybe more, but in this one study, that's what they found or 150 white bark seeds. And this is actually up to 13% of the bird's body weight. So that's a fair amount of weight for this bird to fly off with. It's pretty impressive. Um, they place caches in a wide variety of sites. And in years with heavy cone crops, a single nutcracker can cache between 22,000 and 33,000 seeds um, and over 7,000 individual caches. So, I mean, if they only recover 80% of that, that leaves thousands of seeds in the ground for um, to potentially germinate. And you can just imagine like what that does for a plant to have that many buried seeds in the ground. And it's definitely um, highly beneficial to the plant. Um, one of the cool things that I was reading too is that these guys have been observed uh, digging as deep as four feet into the snow to recover seeds during um, the winter, which I find is just fascinating. I love these birds. I'm a snowboarder, as I said. So anytime I'm up on Mount Rose, I'm looking for them because you um, usually hear and see them and they're just so beautiful. But um, here we have a cache that was um, made by a Clark's Nutcracker. And then here you have seedling clumps coming up of white bark pine seeds coming up from a Nutcracker cache. And I just thought this um, illustration was great kind of showing how they're holding the um, seeds in that uh, sublingual pouch. So um, their fledged young stay with them for several months and learn how to store and retrieve caches. So that's probably another reason, um, you know, if they, it's kind of like the cycle where, you know, at some point they need to store the food so that their young can be, um, so that they can nest earlier. And then they have, you know, these longer time periods to be able to um, teach their young how to store food for, um, so when they fledge, they know how it's done. All right, so next we have pinion jays, and that's, um, I've been reading a lot about the different pinion jay surveys that have been going on, and um, sounds pretty awesome. I have not been lucky enough to study them, but I did, um, I was lucky enough to be surrounded by them almost every morning that I was out looking for uh, juniper caches and the pine nuts for a couple years in a row, but um, they are just fascinating and they live in large flocks and have permanently mated pairs. And um, they actually use like traditional caching areas that they'll go to year after year, which is so interesting. And um, I guess one study said that the flocks can have around eight to 10 traditional caching areas within their home range. And they kind of move um, synchronously while they're caching and move between these areas. And I guess they can make between five and uh, nine round trips a day between these caching areas, depending on um, the density of the cones and the distances that from the crops that they're finding to um, their caching locations. They've also been um, observed digging through snow, but at two inches versus four feet, I guess uh, they live more in the Great Basin where there's less snow, but it's still interesting to me. I would just love to see one of them digging into the snow, looking to recover a cache. Um, one of their cool adaptations is they have the featherless nostrils, um, hence the name gymnorhinus or bare nostrils. 
and this allows them to remove seeds from sap filled cones without the sap getting stuck in their feathers. And you can see here this bare uh, nostril um, and pinion pine. If you've ever touched a pinion pine cone, you would know it's extremely sappy. So uh, this is a pretty cool adaptation that allows them to just drill into those cones and pull the seeds out. They um, don't have a sublingual pouch, but they have an expandable ex esophagus that can carry around 40 seeds, which is 12% of their body weight. So um, it's pretty fascinating that uh, they have their own uh, adaptation, despite having the very specific adaptation that the nutcrackers have. So um, on the East Coast, you have blue jays and corvids and um, these guys, there are a lot more oak species. Well, I shouldn't say that there are a lot of different oak species, more scrub oak on this side of North America versus um, the different oak species on the Eastern um, part. But um, blue jays are really important for a variety of oak species. And um, like with the other birds, probably more plants that we don't even know about yet that have yet to be uncovered. Um, in Europe, there are a lot of studies that have looked at caching um, of Eurasian jays, and they're especially important for home oaks and English oaks. In Europe, there are a lot of efforts to restore oak woodlands. Um, so they're, um, these guys are really important, and there are a lot of efforts um, that conservationists are um, trying to figure out how to you know, manipulate and encourage scatter hoarding by jays in order to um, revegetate a lot of oak species. So um, this is um, where there's a lot of research going on and really fascinating um, systems in, in Europe and um, in the United Kingdom as well. So um, here was kind of a cool uh, study that looked at you know, um, your, your Eurasian magpies, they weren't, they weren't a th thought to be as important as scatter hoarders as maybe the jays were. But um, they were found in more, you know, human um, agroforestry systems or human uh, developed systems. Uh, the magpies were actually really important for dispersal of oaks um, because these areas are more disturbed. And anybody who's seen uh, magpies here, they know that they're pretty comfortable around the edges of human habitation. And so in this study, they found that um, the magpies were dispersing from the oak woodlands like into the areas that had been abandoned after um, there were ad after agriculture. So they were looking into how important these guys could be to revegetate some old agricultural sites. And um, they found that they're really important for new oak recruitment. So um, as you can imagine, with all of these seeds being planted, these birds are really important um, for reforestation. Clark to nutcrackers and white bark pine, <clears throat> that's a well-known um, you know, relationship. And as white bark pine continues to decline, it's really important to understand you know, how we can make sure that the relationship between Clark's nutcrackers and that pine um, stay intact. And also there's been studies that have shown them caching limber pines, another um, more high elevation pine um, into burned areas after fire. So these guys, um, as we've been experiencing worse and worse uh, wildfire seasons, you know, these relationships become more and more important. And um, in the Channel Islands is actually um, pretty interesting ecosystem where you have the endemic island scrub jays. And um, on the one island, they have the scrub jays, they're still intact. And on another island, um, they've been missing scrub jays. And so the oak in that area has declined dramatically and they would like to revegetate it. So they're studying the Channel Island scrub jays to see and to better understand that dispersal system and potentially reintroduce them um, to one of the other islands because they found um, one model showed that they could increase the scrub oak population by 281% over 100 um, years. So just to show you how um, important they are in these ecosystems. And as I just said before, Eurasian jays and oak restorations, you have um, managers looking at using techniques such as supplementing acorns um, and then how to encourage jays into habitats by having jay friendly habitat and then restricting um, bird hunting. Um, another important Factor going forward um, with a lot of these mutualistic relationships is understand, understanding how climate change is going to impact them. So 
In order for plants to survive, they're going to need to rapidly adapt and track their niche via seed dispersal. And so um, if plants aren't really following um, their niche along with their animal dispersal agents, this could create a disruption in the seed dispersal mutualism and, you know, mean that plants don't have a way to um, disperse their seeds. And uh, this is um, definitely an issue that they're looking at for rodents and birds going forward because, you know, like, as I said, rodents are more important for a lot of the closer dispersal, whereas birds are really important for that um, between patch dispersal. So um, as our landscapes become more fragmented by wildfire or just conversion to agricultural or um, industrial or whatever, um, we're gonna have more patchy ecosystems. And as the climate warms and makes some of these ecosystems like less hospitable to plants that have lived there for however many years or adapted to that area for um, a long time, um, you know, there's, it's gonna be more and more important that we recognize some of these relationships between the birds and their dispersal agents so we can make sure to keep them intact. And with higher elevation species such as white bark pine that are facing, you know, blister rust, beetle infestation and climate change. I mean, beetle infestation is kind of related to drought and climate change as well. But um, there's already evidence that's showing that nutcrackers are um, shifting their foraging patterns and focusing on the seeds of other pines. I mean, white bark pine is one of their preferred pine, uh, pine species but um, some studies are showing that they're already starting to um, just use other pine seeds. And so this would be obviously devastating for the white bark pine, which is completely dependent on um, nutcrackers. I mean, rodents do disperse white bark pine as well, but rodents usually um, aren't as at those higher elevations. And those are the populations that, you know, as those populations warm, that's one of the areas that's changing more, most rapidly. So um, it's, Pretty important to understand these relationships before they're lost. So with that, um, yeah, I will take any questions and I have some of the main um, sources I used, but obviously there are many more than uh, what I have on there, so. Wonderful, thank you, Andrew. that was great. Yeah. Um, if anyone has questions, please type them in the chat or the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you're following on Facebook, you can type them in the comments and I will be monitoring them there as well. You just did too thorough of a job answering everyone's questions already. <laughs> yeah. Actually, there's like, it's too thorough. I don't know. There's so many relationships. I could just go on and on, but it's kind of ran out. Yeah. Of no, that was great. And it was exciting to learn a little bit more. As you mentioned, we're working on Pinion J stuff. And so, so it was good to just get more and more information um, about them. They're yeah. just so cool. I loved like being out there in the morning. I could hear the fox coming from miles away and I just sit under the juniper tree and like kind of wait and be in the background as they'd come through and forage. I was just like made my day. <laughs> so Very I'd be out there cool. looking for rodents, but I'd be like, oh my God, here they come. <laughs> just so cool. Um, we had one comment that's a great presentation and thank you, which I'm sure is shared by many people. Um, but there's also a question from Alan. Are you familiar with the experiment Steve Vanderwall did on studying spatial recognition in nutcrackers? Oh yeah, I've, I've read all of Steve's papers and <laughs> since he was my advisor. Um, yeah. yeah, Alan, actually I met you before 2016 when you came up to Little Valley for something you might, might not remember, but oh, I was up there okay, yeah. working. Yeah, all right. and that's the first time you asked me to give a lost talk before I give a Metropolitan Gardens one, but yeah, Steve has looked at, you know, because they were looking at um, kind of what what landmarks, if they're using landmarks, um, if nutcrackers were using landmarks um, to recover their caches, and he had them in an in arena in uh, northern Arizona, which I always thought sounded so cool, but then also sounded like so much work because they're just so intelligent. You tell me, like, they would fly at the net and then just go like this and fly straight <laughs> over the... And that's, so I was like, okay, that sounds really difficult, but um, yep. yeah, he did a lot of cool work uh, with nutcrackers. Awesome. 
Uh, we have a question from Jane. What other nuts are the Clark's Nutcrackers using? Yeah, so they're using, um, in our area especially, they'll come down and use pinion pine, ponderosa, Jeffrey. So they'll use most, they'll use other pine seeds, but they do prefer the smaller, white bark pines are a little bit smaller. And um, that's like one of their preferred seeds. But yeah, they, they cache pinion pines where their ranges overlap. And um, it's kind of cool because they'll come down into the, I guess they've been found like coming all the way down into, you know, Jeffrey Pine and then going straight back up. Vanderwall's like tracked, was tracking them at one point. And they were, the distance they cover between caching is kind of mind blowing. Like they're such powerful flyers that they're just going up and down the mountain like throughout the day. It's pretty, pretty impressive. Yeah, I had one in my yard the other day and we don't normally see them this low, but yeah, <laughs> it's cool to see. Uh, Suzanne asks, are Utah junipers dispersed by birds also in the pine nuts? Uh, no, that's what my research actually found out. Um, it was kind of dogma that all juniper was dispersed by birds. But I mean, in the five years I was out there, I didn't observe a single bird take any of my berries that I had out. Um, so Utah juniper, according to Eugene Shoup, who's the expert on that tree in general, he even published a paper on rabbits dispersing it, but then years later told me he didn't think that they were that important. So it has um, a husk that dries out really quick. The berry dries out really fast. And I found that rodents will just husk it off and they take the seed out. And so um, it's probably why birds don't like it because it only stays moist for like, you know, a month out of the year. And then they really dry out. Whereas Western juniper has a really resinous, like you can squish them between your fingers and it's got that green resin. So the birds like them because they're juicy. You can actually, I've watched the wax wings go through and feel to see because the trees will have ripe and unripe berries on the same tree. So the wax wings are cool because they'll go through and they'll like feel them with their beak and they'll spit out the unripe ones and then eat the, so it's like I observed all this foraging on Western juniper and then the entire time I was out in the pine nuts, I didn't observe a single bird eating any Utah juniper. So. That was the conclusion of my yeah master's degree that um, Utah is more dispersed by rodents and then occasionally rabbits. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Steve asks, uh, you did some work in Northeast California on junipers. Can you say more about the dispersal of juniper seeds by birds and mammals? Um, yeah, so just did. <laughs> yeah, I kind of, one thing I didn't mention with Western juniper that is kind of cool that we found is that, um, we kind of identify that there's a two phase dispersal process where the birds eat the berries and then poop them out. And then the rodents are taking the seeds that are pooped out under the perches and then they're caching that. So it's a two phased dispersal system that's called diplocory. Steve Vanderwall and my um, supervisor, Bill Longwin, came up with that term. So um, yeah, that's what we identified. So Western Juniper has this two phase dispersal system because rodents were less. Um, they would take the whole berries, but um, they would sit and chew the, the um, berry flesh off a lot of times. But then I had seeds that I'd collected from bird poop. I actually had to miss net robins and bring them back. And I fed them a ton of uh, juniper berries. And then I cleaned all the seeds out of there. We like, I tried not to make it too clean, but at least like so that I could count the number of seeds. And then I put those out in trays. And then I had those versus whole berries. And then I had Utah juniper whole berries and um, Utah juniper seeds. And I had both all four types at both Western Juniper and Utah Juniper sites to see what rodents prefer. And rodents, yeah, generally they'll take the bird past seeds like no problem. So um, then we also do documented them removing those seeds in a few different other experiments. So yeah, that seems to be um, more of the dispersal system for Western Juniper. And then um, for other junipers, it's still unknown. I might, yeah, I might go back and do a PhD of it at this point. I just bought a house, so I'm like, okay, teaching sounds chill for a while. <laughs> yeah, well, that actually ties into Alan's next question of, are you doing any field research currently or just teaching these days? Yeah, not I'm, I'm just teaching. Yeah, not just, <laughs> no, I'm definitely just teaching. Uh, all my teacher friends lied and they were like, oh, you'll be a great teacher. It'll be so fun. You're going to love it. And I do love it, but nobody planned to tell me how difficult all of the lesson planning was. So, um, oh, yeah, yeah, it definitely is taking up a lot of my time. I, um, I have two more papers that I'm writing up old data. And so I'm not really doing any field work right now. I'm trying to get the last two publications done. I think I have 
have 16 publications now. I have like two more that I need to wrap up and then um, I kind of want to write, write a review article. So I don't think I'll be doing field work for a bit, but I do have trail cameras and rodent traps I'm going to be putting up at the school um, cool. so that we can do some surveying along the creek area um, with the kids and then actually collect data so that they can have some actual data to play with. That's fun. Yeah. Uh, one more question. David asks, if pines shift with climate warming, would their seed dispersers follow? Which would come first? That's a great question and something <laughs> that is like the literature. Your PhD, potentially. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it's something that people are still like kind of trying to figure out. Um, one of the poster children for this is a uh, I mean, this isn't a pine, but uh, Joshua trees and their dispersal agents are uh, antelope ground squirrels. And they're already finding in areas where there's been massive die-offs of, you know, Joshua trees. That's one of the places. And then antelope ground squirrels are kind of shy. Like they're not like your typical California ground squirrel where they're going to be in really, um, you know, um, human um, uh, impacted areas. So um, that's an area, that's one where they expect their ranges to kind of dislocate not overlap and then they're worried about um the joshua tree survival because the loss of its dispersal agent um would be catastrophic because it's only really got um very few dispersal agents whereas with some of the pines um you know lower elevation pines they have not just birds dispersing their seeds they have you know anywhere from one to five different rodents dispersing their seeds and so the hope is that some of the dispersal agents will track with um those plants but as I was saying with white, white bark pine, where they have a very, um, a much smaller um, community of animals that disperse their seeds and they really are dependent kind of on just the Clark's nutcracker, that's where you get into this um, area where, you know, it is um, scary that you could think that they could in a lot of the parts of their range um, not overlap in the future. But some trees like oaks are lucky that they have this like diverse assemblage. And that means that they'll be more resilient with changing climate since at least some of their um, dispersal agents will hopefully continue to overlap with them. Awesome. Well, it's a little bit of a sad note to end on, <laughs> but it's, it's the reality. Um, Lindsay, I want to thank you so much for presenting tonight. This was a wonderful presentation. I know I learned a lot, and like thank I said, um, it ties right into some of our pinion J work. So if you are interested in getting out there and doing some surveys, there's I would pretty, love pretty low commitment there, but it would uh, be an opportunity for you to get back out there with the J's. So um, we'd love to have you. Oh, and, I would uh, like emailing you about that. That sounds awesome. Perfect. That'd be great. Um, well, with that, I want to thank you. Next month, we'll be having Julie Bless from Endow talking about some of their citizen science projects that they've got going on. So um, tune in next month. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Take care.